Good morning, everybody. I'm Mark Spiegler, Director of Art Basel. I'd like to welcome you to the first of four panels in this year's conversation series. We will start today with a conversation with Linda Benglis, the legendary American artist. Um, I'm ashamed to say that we've never been successful in getting enough great women artists on stage for these talks, and so I'm very happy that this year we have succeeded. Thank you, Linda. Um, I think, and I think it's, of course, my comment is doubly appropriate given the, uh, the controversy that erupted 40 years ago with the infamous Art Forum ad, which I'm sure will come up at some point in this hour-long conversation. I know you didn't come out to see me this morning, so I'll make it quick, but I still think it's worth mentioning the other talks that are happening the rest of the week. Tomorrow we have a talk which is focused on new funding for, for the arts, um, including uh, a panelist from Kickstarter with whom we've done a very successful project uh, in the course of the last 10 weeks, we've raised more than $185,000 for eight different nonprofits in the visual arts. So I think for those of you who are interested in thinking about where the money will come from in the arts, if the government isn't doing it, if the corporations aren't doing it, this might be an interesting talk to attend as well. The next day, we have um, two great curators and one great collector, all of whom are focused on, on the artists to the south of here, the Caribbean and Latin America, talking about collecting and curating outside of the traditional centers of the art world. And last but not least, on Sunday we have the continuing, uh, the continuation of the Artist As series that Hans Ulrich Ober started a few years ago, and this time it's the Artist as Curator. So without further ado, I will get off stage and let you see the people you actually came to see. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Suzanne Weaver. I'm the new interim director at the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami, the new museum here in Miami. So this is a great honor and privilege that I'm able to have a conversation with Linda Binglis. I've been stalking her for a long time. When I was at the Dallas Museum of Art, I was fortunate to buy purchase for the museum, Odalosk, Hey Hey, Frankenthaler, 1969, Port pigmented uh, latex and then when I was at the Speed Art Museum we received the 50 the gifts by the Vogels that project 50 museum 50 works of art and there were two of Linda's works in there and I tried to get her to come to uh, Louisville as I did try to get her to come to Dallas and I she wasn't able to come so now I have her trapped on stage uh, Linda is a real renegade, risk taker, restless, rule breaker. For 45 years, she's experimented with and blurred lines between painting and sculpture and pushed the philosophical, physical, and sensuous possibilities of form, color, surface, and material. Beeswax, pigmented latex, polyurethane, video, glass, ceramics, that's just only a few things. She's created images that are even I iconic ones that can be read and experienced in many ways, male, female, beautiful, ugly, natural, man-made, free-form, structured, abstract, representational. She's borrowed from the fields of abstract expressionism, color filled painting, pop art, minimalism, and it made it her own. She has been in the forefront of post-minimalism, process, performance, body art, categories that she helped define and defy. For 45 years, she has made work that is boundary pushing, experimental, and ultimately necessary. She was born in Lake Charles, Louisiana in 1941. She received a BFA from Newcomb College. Her work has been shown at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Tate Modern, the Museum of Modern Art, New York, Whitney, I could go on and on. We'd be here for a very long time. She's received awards from the Guggenheim Philadelphia Museum, National, excuse me, uh, she, the Guggenheim and the, NAS, the NEA. She is represented by Chyman Reed and Franklin Parish Galleries. Recently in 2009, she had a traveling retrospective that was exhibited in the Netherlands, traveled to the Irish Museum of Modern Art, Dublin, Dijon Museum of Modern Art, RISD, and finally to the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York in 2011. 
She is, as I was saying, she's received two grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and at Guggenheim and has taught at School of Visual Arts, the University of Arizona, Yale University, Princeton, and, and Cal Arts. So today we're going to talk about her, her latest work, uh, The Fountains, and I hope everyone has seen her spectacular piece at the uh, Collins Park in front of the Bass Museum. It's an amazing, very, very, they're water, they're these water, um, these fountains, and it's very garish, sexy, the light is amazing, and the water is going all the time, and you can stand there and really experience, it's a very immersive kind of experience. So, with that, with me getting off and quit talking, I'll let you uh, begin talking about your work, Linda. Well, I was just saying that uh, this is my second time showing the fountains, and, or a fountain, uh, in Miami at the Bass Museum. Uh, before, there was a kind, a kind of cantilever piece that's now a part of uh, a larger uh, work of the same form, uh, times four, installed in Dublin. And at the Dublin uh, Gardens, where the uh, major museum is in Dublin. Uh, there, this is an installation in Dijon, uh, which is more Rococo. Uh, they have been Baroque and Rococo, but they're, for me, they're very classic forms. So there's, there's the movement and the gesture, but there's also, a, they are restrained. Uh, in the sense that the form uh, is proportioned to the human uh, and uh, to the proprioceptive muscular feelings of the body in relationship to the, the form giving water. So this is the uh, insulation of the four pieces. One moves into the other somewhat with the photographs, but when you go around this quite a distance, and the pieces are, are coming in as a volcano explosion. So this is the north, south, east, west. I'm doing another version of this north, south, east, west by pouring on top of the work itself and making a kind of crustacean with, uh, which is more uh, buoyant or more uh, less still in motion, but caps as if, um, as if the plant, I, I noticed that you have some fantastic boulevard of uh, cypresses here, of trunks, where the trunks, when cut, be, uh, have, have kind of, they continue to grow. The Cambrian tissue continues to grow outwards. So these kinds of forms in nature I like very much. This is a kind of cornucopia form. It was my first fountain commission as such. Uh, and uh, I had actually done three uh, uh, totem-like pieces that were called the graces. And so someone saw the graces and said they wanted a fountain, which were, I always intended that these cornucopias with the bowl catching the water, a bowl at the top uh, delivering the water, this is installed in, in here now. This was installed in Philadelphia and it's beautifully installed in the grounds in, in front of the uh, museum here. Uh, so that's a photograph that uh, John Chine took on the right of uh, the, the light coming through the polyurethane itself. Now, there are many kinds of polyurethane. It was made with a polyurethane uh, and the color and the form itself was in cast. I wonder if, if uh, Dylan is here from my foundry. Is Dylan here? I'm just wondering. Hey, come up front now. You want to bring a chair up? Yeah. Come on. This is informal conversation. Sit on this other side. Okay, because... Uh, <laughs> okay, he's right. sitting over there. Okay, we move, we move a little bit. Okay, so, yeah, join in. Uh, I'm sorry, so what? There's a machine, that, uh, the foundry, 
Dylan. Yes. <laughs> Walla Walla Foundry in Washington, D.C. Anyway, they have the equipment. I think it's one of the best foundries in the world because I envisioned the totem as being one on top of the other, but uh, at that time they had not the machinery. And, uh, but they have also the machinery to do this kind of casting. Do you want to tell them a little bit about what you have at the foundry? Uh, for this, this type of work? Yeah. Um, we, do, we do pressure casting with resin. Sorry, you can hear me. Uh, and, and so the resin is in a liquid form and we put it into the molds. The same molds that we use for the bronze, which you can see a bronze piece at the bottom. But for the, for the resin, when it's in liquid form, we put the whole mold into a, a giant uh, steel tank and then pressurize it. Yeah. And it, uh, similar to a, a canoe, when you tip it upside down in the water, uh, air is trapped up in the, uh, on the bottom of it. And the, by pressurizing the mold, it forces that resin up into the mold to capture all of the, it's a little difficult to see in that picture, but the very like rich uh, surface detail. This, this is the totem that I, I actually finally envisioned, the, the 30 foot totem in bronze. I envisioned it as being stacked one on top of the other. It, and Linda, it really reminds me of Thank Brent Cousy. It really reminds me of Brent Cousy's Endless Call. I, I thought of that and, and uh, when I was thinking about it, and I've seen it, the Endless Column. And uh, it, it was just, I envisioned something in my head and emotionally. So, and that was my first fountain was the Candelaber Wave of the World. They asked me to call it uh, when I got the commission from the World's Fair in the 80s. And uh, they, they had to have the title Wave of the World. And I promised basically that I would not do another one in the same way. I signed a contract with the World's Fair. Well, the World's Fair went bust, the wave disappeared. I didn't know where it was for a while, and basically it was taken. And it's been more than 10 years, so I signed a contract after, after I had borrowed it, by the way, and took it to Monte Carlo. They wanted to buy it, but the person who had taken it, so to speak, uh, didn't want to sell it. So later, he gave it to the city of, uh, of Kenner, and uh, so I was trying to find out where it was, and it was kind of stored in what was a junkyard, and it became a scandal. So this, this wave, I saw that it needed to be fixed. I was so happy when I found it. I just had gone to New Orleans and on the wharf, and I just happened to meet this, the designers that were uh, helping to orchestrate a whole series in the boulevard leading to the airport, which is in the, in the city of Kenner, leading to New Orleans. They, they showed me what they were doing and they wanted to install the way, perhaps, at the airport. So they showed me where it was. So then it was end of the nightmare. It wasn't carried away by Katrina. So I was very happy to find it. And so with my own uh, means, I brought the fountain back to the foundry that you saw in the beginning, and I repaired it. And now uh, the city of Kenner and uh, the city of New Orleans, City Park, have negotiated a loan for five years. And then it may or may not stay there, or it may go to the airport if they redesign the airport. So all these things with large sculpture are always up in the air because there, there isn't the kind of commitment that say artists or foundries when they collaborate or people that show things which are you know the museums and and the galleries that commit themselves to getting things moving so I I, ha I lament that we don't have enough fountains in this world and we certainly don't have many fountains in, uh, in the US uh, we we do see them historically. We have had them, but we don't have them anymore. So many. Well, Linda, what it, we're um, saying about fountains and being a public art, what, how different are they when you think about what they do or say toward public art? Well, I I like to always think that really good art looks back at you, 
and a fountain would be not only looking back at you, but communicating uh, with feeling uh, in touching it and uh, looking at the water and hearing sound. And uh, everybody likes water. Everybody it's likes so basic. Water. It's so basic in our, it uh, is. our life. This particular piece, you can see the pink fountain in the, in the background there. This particular piece, I was thinking of hills and clouds, but also the growth of plants. So it, it kind of uh, looks, looks a bit like the water itself. Um, It's on my glass, I think. Here, no, no. Okay. Uh, there was a reason for these glasses. There you go. Okay, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, so, so this, there you see, I tried a different approach. This piece is about 17 and a half, 17 and a half feet uh, square. And uh, I used one by twos to build the framework of the uh, movement of the pouring. And what happened? going to swallow it. <laughs> so, so you can see this is along the wall but it also comes out from the wall. Uh, this looks like maybe a process shot or it's uh, anyway it's quite off the wall. Comes, this is during, is this during the making of it? It looks very narrow. Yeah I think that's the perspective on the photo. That's, it's, it's yeah this comes out 27 and a half feet, so what you're looking at, you don't know what you're looking at, but there, there is the form. Thank you. Now let's, and I wanted to ask you about um, clouds. I mean, your interest, you've, this form, why, what are so interesting about how you form when you're looking up at clouds, what happens? You know, when you start to make an image, or well, we we all do the same thing uh, visually. We we look at we look at phenomena in a way that we organize it in space so that we can understand it, and we give it animation. So, or we give it we we always give it a gestalt. We identify with it, and it's one way to make us feel better about what we don't understand and what, but what we feel. So my intention is always to think about the organization of what we don't understand and what we feel. And when we look at clouds or we when look at water or reflections and something that is continuously in motion, and I like the idea of my work being in motion visually, uh, and I like it being a whole, but I'm trying to express a phenomenological whole uh, uh, that is a body of, uh, or a happening, a being of, of a kind. So this is what this is. Uh, the design is for stainless steel. I'm going to show the one by twos in stainless that will be the support but it, essentially it will be floating with the, the idea of the clouds being the uh, more buoyant and the less dripping kind. So I'm still thinking about what is going to be phosphorescent. It will kind of float in the air, the whole thing. So the, some of it will be bronze, perhaps, or it might be all phosphorescent. I have to figure out uh, as, as I'm doing it, what the illusion or what the paint uh, illusionistically is. I like things to have, sculpture to have illusion. It's not just a matter of moving one square to one, or a cube or one uh, plane against the other. That's, uh, you've used uh, this phosphorus kind of material for years, since the 70s, 60s and 70s. 
And what are you, you're getting that through like uh, ideas about movement, ideas about light. I, light seems to be a huge underlying theme for you. That's true, in the, in the material. In fact, I noticed when I did installations with the phosphorus against the wall, pouring out from the wall, uh, <clears throat> there were vapor lights at the top and the vapor lights lit the top so that it was more brilliant. And as the piece kind of slowed down, it was less brilliant, uh, but still it was lit up. So when the lights were turned out, you have the illusion of the piece rising and falling at the same time. So this, this really happens illusionistically, that the piece kept moving, your eyes keep adjusting in the phosphorescence. Those were the, was that the wings, the wings or the yes. phantoms? Yes. They, yes, That was from the time you did the uh, paintings on the floor and you took it to the wall and they, right. they just cantilevered out. That's right. Magnificent. They were so great in your uh, retrospective. So this is the understructure, this is the process shot as I'm building. Let's continue. Let's continue. So do we have a video? Uh, what happened? Is there motion here at this point? There, uh, that's not all the pieces. I'm just Here's wondering. the wave of the world. Did we, yes, yeah. yes. I talked about that. That was installed in New Orleans. And, uh, and that really looks like, it reminds me of the wings and the phantoms. And it's very prehistoric looking and rising. That's as you said, and falling. a half bit count delivered a two ton bronze. Oh. Wow. Tell me something again about, a little more about, you talked about gesture and your work is gesture. Is it? Is it an expressionistic gesture, or when you talk about uh, working in this kind of material? We think of de Kooning working in bronze, but his is, of course, very representation of a woman. Well, de Kooning actually did 10 pieces in clay with his hands. And there's a couple of pieces that I did, one at the foundry in Walla Walla, and one at the foundry in uh, New York, where I took and I was impressed because de Kooning did the pieces, they were 10 inches. And then for Cod, uh, his dealer enlarged them by 10. And then he enlarged them by 10 again and 10 the third time. So you had these huge de Kooning pieces and the thumbprint was like that, you know. And I was very impressed as I saw these being done uh, of, say, different scale, the first by 10. Uh, the idea that there was that thumbprint. So afterwards, I got some clay, lots of clay, stacks of clay, both in both foundries. And I did the first piece in the Modern Art Foundry. It was called, well, I did the first piece, actually, it's at the Museum of Modern Art. And I go leafed it, and it's hanging on the wall. And uh, I, I cut clay with wire but had made a form out of plaster and, and this uh, same material, hemp. So I made this form with chicken wire and sticks and then I put plaster over it and then I put, uh, after that I put clay. And uh, it was wet clay and I, I was very quickly, I was being ha handed all this clay as I cut it and I would cut the form in such a way that I was making a, a, a sculptural surface, a skin, on top of another skin form. So we just cast that skin and hung it on the wall. And then I decided to make the skin as a sculpture. So I had to do a larger form. And again, took the clay and in both Modern Art Foundry and in Walla Walla, I did two different kinds of forms. In Walla Walla, I did the form that had six points that, that you really, that was like a bird. It had wings, seven, seven kind of uh, wings. But six, I think less than six, maybe there were three on the ground or four on the ground. But it, it looked like it was going to take off. And then the other one was my great uh, cloak wave, which was like a figure 
where you can see it in front, you saw the figure cloak wave with a, a, a big, like a Japanese uh, kimono, and you can see the surface kind of hovering toward you, and then you can see the inside, which was remain bronze. What was interesting about seeing the inside outside, the pressure of working with the clay uh, repeated the form of not only the fingerprints, but also the form of the plaster. So there was a nice kind of dialogue of one history and then the other on top and then the fingerprints. But they were all in scale. I didn't blow them up. I, I kept them the same. And the, the, now uh, there's a possibility, I keep thinking, what if I became larger? You know, uh, and I'm thinking, what happens if things became larger? Not that larger is better, but I've remained human scale. And th there's something very nice about that. But I still, you know, you ask yourself all the questions that sh you can think of because that's just the logic of thinking and science. Uh, you know, to, in order to go on, uh, I have to think w what may, what could happen. And uh, that's how I think within context. Any questions? I'm just going on and on. <laughs> but I want to be sure we, is this the only translation? Because I haven't seen other fountains here. There, there, there must be more. This is the restoration. Yeah, this is the restoration. But I have many more. I don't know what, is there any other thing that you all have here? This is at the museum here. You can see uh, in Miami in 2003. Wasn't that the third uh, fair? The first fair happened in 2000? I don't know. 2002 was the first so fair. So this was the second one then that, that I participated. So this is the, this one you this can really is a talk about. Wave. You, you that's can really, that's the one I was talking about. Right, you can really talk so about the your black, surface. So the black is the surface. Thank you. And uh, so that you can see rectangles, you can see all kinds of different pieces. It was, I sort of thought of it as like a puzzle, when, when you know, how important as puzzles are. And then, but it became a kind of skin as well. So, um, of clay, and some people even thought it was clay because it had that wet feeling of the pressure of the hand fingers going into the clay. I, I think that's about it. I can continue to talk about uh, the different images here. This is at uh, Larson's. Uh, Jack Larson is a uh, designer, major fabric designer. And uh, there you can see it from the side. So you, it takes form and it has a great deal of illusion at the same time. And that's the, the migrating head marks that sort of... Uh, like the birds. Is the birds. Uh, I thought that these could have also been fountains as well, it, because you see water uh, going down the side. Uh, it could, you know, it, I, I could have made them into the fountain, but I only did two castings of this one, and I only did one casting of the other one. And these are only individual castings. They were done thinking of uh, atomic explosions and they were named after particular atomic explosions. So they were atomic cloud forms. Summer dreams is one of them. Looks very much like the bomb. But I studied, I studied that. But I was also inspired by uh, mold I, I, I saw a garden in uh, the Jackalope in Santa Fe that, that there was a kind of concrete fountain, classical fountain, and it was covered with moss. And I got so excited about that that I decided I'd make a, a, a you know, also something that possibly could take on the quality of moss. Can I ask some questions? Sure. <laughs> okay. I guess it's your time. <laughs> no, it's still your time. But um, what I'm interested in is that for 40 some years you've been able to bring in ideas and keep your work fresh, processes, material. But I also read somewhere that you collect 
places. And I know you have studios in a number of places and you've had long relationships with people and you're teaching. I'm just wondering, like each of those areas that you, your studios, like in what, New Mexico? You have a studio in Mexico, New Mexico, Long Island, and where else? Um, now Walla Walla. Yeah. But, but, but the foundries are my studio. They're your studio. And my assistants, my, you know, the energy, the collaboration. So that's I want Dylan here because he's been so important to me as a collaborator. You know, and he collaborates with very, very good artists in Walla Walla. And they come there and Walla Walla is in nowhere. I mean, so it's in the it, middle of wheat fields. What's you know, a successful the, the collaboration? Town. What is a successful collaboration? That's good. Cool. for me. Mm -hmm. How to how Just, work with artists to make this happen for you? I mean, it's kind of a larger question. <laughs> uh, I think it's when, when it becomes experiential, so that uh, when we move beyond being a manufacturing facility, right, and, and move into a, a place where it's where it's some, somewhere where, uh, where where the artist comes and, and experiences uh, the people that work. For them, right. If that makes yeah. sense. Uh -huh. and, so, it, and that's the great thing too, that they they have grown from. 12 to 22 people to 150 to 120 and there's an educated and a real love to to get involved with the work at this foundry which was is marvelous it's grown in that way people get involved with the ideas and you've worked with uh, printmakers too and uh, paper too if we're i actually have i'm producing my own uh, not making the own own pulp, but I'm making my own paper sculpture, and that's what I'm doing now. And the processes are similar, and I'm I, I love doing it because I'm doing making skins over form. Interesting idea about skin and surface, your relationship ongoing with that. And uh, I like oh, yeah. air. I'd like to enclose air vessels. They're vessels. I think we are, we are walking water vessels ourselves. Breathing vessels. We are very aware of this kind of body breathing, absolutely. <coughs> Air, and so, water. Uh, when did you move? Did, <coughs> you spent a lot of time in India. When did you move, to start going to India? About 30, I don't know, 38 years ago. Wow. And so how transformative was that? How was the landscape and culture? How did it affect your work? Shocking at first, you know, very shocking. I loved it, hated it, and I, I, you know, it just. There are certain places, and it, 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 it's kind of. Uh, I'm totally. You totally get saturated. That's all, and you can't deny that it exists, and the just the, the density, of it is amazing. The layering is amazing, so. It's just something that uh, you develop an appetite for. Mm -hmm. that, I think that's travel. We, we have our places that we love and we have this appetite. It's very... So you've, had, you've had an opportunity to see forms. You've traveled where you've seen like ancient forms and well, being able to experience absolutely. classical. Absolutely. And it, don't you think it's so important for artists to travel? Well, it's, it's important for anyone to see that uh, there are cultures that if they have an interesting form, they begin to worship it. So this is what India is about. Uh, they are very visual. They're very, it's a very textured um, society. So, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll ask a couple more questions and let the audience ask questions, but I, I want to still ask, I can't not ask you this question, and you've been asked a zillion times, and if I don't ask, somebody will probably ask in the audience. But this long relationship you've had in the media, and your famous art form ad of, of you with really oiled with a dildo, and um, 
There was also the postcards you did for Paula Cooper, the exhibition where you were, your back with your pants down and exposed. And you also did those incredible videos in the 70s. So uh, I have a question to ask you about your relationship to feminism and feminist theory. What is the question? The question is, <laughs> what was your relationship back then in the 70s? And where are you now in that? Well, I felt I was riding a wave. I felt I had to say something about that. And I began to study pinups. And uh, so I did this. I did this old fashioned one. And, and I thought, and, but in doing it, I was also having uh, men pose for me in that way. Uh, Ray Johnson was one, and uh, a boyfriend was one, and, and I, I was thinking, well, I'll get Jesus on the lap of Mary, and I told, actually, I was asked by Playboy magazine, I think, to do something, but they wanted me in it, and I didn't want that, and it called to my mind when Warhol asked me to do something with my then partner, uh, which was a very sexual pose, making love, you know, and he wanted to do a movie, and I thought, well, you know, I began thinking about all of that, me as an object uh, being kind of in that way, and women as objects, so I decided, okay, uh, maybe I'll think about what a sexual being is as an artist. And so I began thinking all kinds of things. Uh, later, like Playboy did do, you know, Jesus with, uh, in the lap with Mary. Uh, after that, I, and I, you know, at that time though, they wanted just women artists to pose. Uh, so I, I thought when I did this Betty Grable pose, I realized it was a mistake because Somebody came into the gallery and said, who did that to her? And then I realized that I had to make the, a very strong statement about sexuality, uh, where it was both man and woman, where, where it was kind of like a hermaphrodite. I, and I did later a dog, the amazing Bow Wow, that happened to be both. And uh, I, I did a little skit, the idea, the concept of skit, and played uh, Rexena. And the Bow Wow was a show dog. And that's a video that you can actually see. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, so d in doing this, I wanted to, an image that uh, looked back at you, so to speak. And that was, uh, not, not really clear. It was a confrontational image. And I knew when I had done it, which one, I did three poses basically, and I knew which one was the artwork. And uh, I just stupidly, I said to Art Forum, they wanted to put me a nod on the cover, and then, but they, I wanted, even without this article that came about, uh, they, they wanted to publish the three pieces that I had studied. And I said, no, you don't understand. I just want you to, and I stupidly gave them three. So then I had to get a lawyer and say that there was only one. I copyrighted it and so forth uh, because the one was the artwork. But they would not let me have a fold out. Uh, later, I wanted the center of the magazine. I didn't care about the article uh, because I was so sort of sure that that was the context of, that I wanted to present it as art, and that was the magazine then. So, and it changed the nature of the magazine because the, 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 the critics, the five critics gang-banged me and resigned. And, and it made, started you October. The, you made the bronze uh, dildos, didn't you, for each of the critics? I did, yeah. <laughs> bronze, not, not many, just the bronze, all the medals. Just the medals, the medals. And who are the critics? You're, who knows? Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do we have any questions? The audience? Yes. 
had, I think that uh, what I've heard you, uh, I've, I've heard you uh, <clears throat> describing, is that it's coming up? It's not working. I've heard you describing uh, uh, what I think is a pretty creative life, going with ideas. And uh, I'm curious about what your, what, if you've got any idea what's going on now, what might be new. I know you've said that you like uh, the, uh, the collaborations with your text, but is there anything in your mind that you can share with us that you're interested in pursuing now? Well, one thing leads to the other, um, and you know, it kind of is a spark, and then it leads you to other things. There might be just something that I see, say, like those cypress trees, and then I think, oh, those cypress trees may tell me something about what I'm doing in paper. I'm making forms with wire again, and wet paper, I cover the, the form. And uh, even these, the process of doing this and doing different things with the paper and the wire lead me to different things. So I'll see something and then I'll think about, okay, what is that feeling I have? I don't think literally what is the feeling, what is the image, but you know, it'll trigger a spark and the paper burns up. <laughs> it, yeah. it is a, another work, you know? It, yeah. It's something else. That leads me to another question, uh, because you've had this long, um, you've had many relationships with artists over time. You came to New York in the 60s. I mean, what a time. You knew Barnett Newman. And, and, uh, and so what was the relationship and how it affected your work, but also how has the art world changed from the uh, 60s, a quick summary, the 60s, the 70s, before there was a Basel Art Fair. And so then, as that changed, how did, with your relationship to artists, and how collegial was that, how collaborative was that? Well, I, when you saw Barnett Newman, you would not see him without Annalee. Annalee was his wife, and uh, she taught school. She supported Barney. Barney was the son of a haberdasher. So he had these, they looked like they were out of a 30s cartoon. They really did. She was still in kind of wonderful, beautiful clothes with big pads and pumps. And uh, he was in his tweed jacket and hat with a feather. And then you go into their um, living room and there was one chair and one couch. And then there was a totem piece that he did at Lippincott's. So he, he, Actually, Bob Murray, the, the, a group of Canadians introduced him to fabricators that were fabricators. They had never done real, real art. They were fabricators, metal fabricators. So they were doing planar sculpture. Bob Murray was painting, painting uh, steel, cartoon steel. Barney had a piece in plaster, which was uh, basically, it was a I-beam stuck in a cow pie of plaster. And that was in, this, in the living room when I went in. And uh, just the fact that, say, this couple shared a relationship that was, and just the, the way he treated people and the way they were so genteel, so just so, just, you know, what you wouldn't, ex my idea at that time of, of an artist was Jackson Pollock, you see, and then when I met him, my ideas totally changed because I saw that they, they lived and breathed art. I mean, you, you know, and they were just like anybody else in a way. So I, I began to kind of realize that the art world is a large community, and he was very open to young people coming into his life. We, he danced, you know. Jitterbug. He, he loved to jitterbug, 
and I remember Jitterbug, you with him, and Annalie was a friend, he had dropped dead of a heart attack while he was jitterbugging, and he was a heavy drinker, and he, he, they would stay up all night, we would go to Cat's Deli at four in the morning, and he would have eggs and spinach, you know, <laughs> and just a great guy, and so knowing the artists, meeting different artists, and I was so lucky to have that, uh, I, I think really that's what changed my life when I went to the city and that's why it's so important to kind of realize that kind of human exchange and uh, it, you know it involves a lot more than processes you know our human exchange our you know today so we're so dependent on this world this art world and fairs like it's all it's become a, a center, fairs are centers for seeing and believing, I guess you could say. I saw the exhibition, it was fantastic, that Katie Siegel curated High Times, <laughs> was it hard to High Times in the 70s? And it was really great, you were in it, and um, a number of artists, Rockburn, but I felt a real sense. Hard Times. Hard Times. Hard Times. High times. High times hard New times. York. I, but I, yeah. I really felt there was a camaraderie. I don't know. There was a, like experimentation and curiosity and dialogue, real dialogue. So you were, had relationships. Good. You were friends with these artists. You would get together and talk about things. Uh, well, Dorothea Rockburn, for instance, showed at the same gallery uh, when I first presented the latex painting on the floor. And there was a big spot, because I did it directly on the parquet floor, uh, right off Madison Avenue on 81st Street. And so uh, she insisted, she was the next show, she insisted that the floor be redone. And I don't blame her, because you know she was working on the floor. She did some paper doyle. Uh, I think it was ma masonite and paper and oil uh, anyway and then there was a, a, another artist that came, Bollinger, Bill Bollinger came along and did powdered lead room can you imagine a lead powdered room graphite you know graphite and he filled the room with a sea of graphite and of course the, the red rug that was <laughs> newly put down in the second floor carpet got stamped with uh, all kinds of footprints of powdered graphite up and down. And, and I'll ask the audience to, I mean, I'll let the audience ask another question, but the thing that's also changed in the art world is art schools. The rise of art schools, MFA programs, and you've taught in a number of really important art schools. And how do you feel that teaching and academia and also the type of artists and how they learn to be an artist and, I mean, how do you feel that the relationship with art schools and what are art schools doing now or should be doing? You know, I'm looking, I'm, excuse me, I'm just looking at this image. Why, I think the lens on this projector is, is uh, at fault uh, because That's these the, things are really big. You and can it's tell making that, it, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 you know, totally, uh, it's, this is another work, all these are another works, because what, it's like, uh, you know, they're like this instead of like that. So, uh, art schools, are, are, I still am uh, at uh, visual arts, and I think art schools are very important to, uh, to the manner of uh, an organization of the mind. Uh, and their labs, basically their labs. Uh, and the exercise programs that you have dealing with working artists and artists coming to talk and so forth, that's very helpful. Uh, but I think a well-rounded education in other fields are equally necessary. Logic was very important to me in philosophy, so I, if I hadn't had that kind of early on, and my, you know, maybe all up. artists should have to take that as part of the curriculum. That that a lot of things that I think uh, and other yeah, disciplines. Yeah, other disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any more? Any questions? I have, I have one. Um, could you speak to the um, the conflict between the sacredness and the natural form 
and the profanity found in the, the atomic explosion that you explore in the uh, Summertime and Thunderbird works. Well, there's a bit of irony. I think a lot of uh, art has a kind of uh, sense of irony. Uh, a lot of, when I get into those more, I guess, uh, literary kind of associations, uh, there is that irony. There was irony in the pinup. There was irony in this uh, idea of the, uh, the the explosions were beautiful. The photographers who took the photographs of the explosions you know, saw that they were beautiful, and yet, you know, we, we know how menacing symbolically, you know, that beauty is. So, there's, there's that. Uh, you know, it's painful to think about that. I mean, if you see one, those films, I mean, it's, it's very scary when you see those films. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, essentially uh, nature is so much more powerful than art and uh, we're just, you know, the what, tip of the iceberg just trying to uh, go there. But we are nature itself so the human life is much more important than art. But we have to have, uh, we make value judgments and, and trade and so forth. And we also make uh, icons. And we need that, to, again, because, uh, you know, there's a void. It's scary out there. So that's an important value for art in our life. Well, it's, it's, it's the value. But also, I think it's the best way of spending your time, so I don't apologize for it. <laughs> Can't imagine doing anything else anymore. I wonder if you can uh, talk a little bit more about your experience in India. I think it's amazing works right there. And just how um, the question was about going back to India and talking about some of the works you made there. And, um, that related to culture and your rich experience there and the people you met there? Um, well, I visited with a family there that uh, supported the arts. Uh, Calder had been there and um, they, they <laughs> that, uh, had gone there, Rauschenberg and Robert Morris, and uh, they would stay for a month to six weeks and during that time they would work for three weeks or so to four weeks and then travel the last two weeks. That was what was suggested. Uh, uh, Frank Stella went there. Artists didn't like to stay so long or be away from their work and their contacts, but they, they went anyway and Rauschenberg had been there uh, because of the Venice Biennale very early on. The Bride and the Bachelors uh, Calvin Tompkins talks about that trip to India, and, you know, because Merce Cunningham was there. So this this family, and particularly uh, 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 a person in the family that took on inviting them, there were actually two aunts of my friend Anna, and he became he was the person that invited me, and then uh, his two aunts had invited other artists and his mother had asked Corbusier Car to do a home there and so she designed a home and with Corbu um, and he was very stringent in saying we don't want any doors but she had to have doors in the bathroom or we don't want a window on this we don't this is not a place for a window but she would insist upon the window so and there were very nice letters back and forth that that document this time. So I was very impressed with his family and because I grew up in Louisiana, the environment uh, in terms of vegetation and so forth was not foreign to me and the people were so friendly. I felt immediately at home and I liked vegetarian food. So it was just a match. And it was also challenged me and challenged the way I felt about the world. It was, you know, it was very challenging and I like to be challenged. So I felt at home and I was challenged at the same time. 
and they they made it possible. I didn't have to think about cooking or, you know, they made it possible for me to, and other artists, just to have this kind of little studio where you could think of other ideas and Anand, who became my uh, life partner, uh, was able, because he was a scientist, was able to think out of the box. In fact, he was very childlike in a lot of his thinking. I mean, he could marvel. He would think about the most ridiculous kind of juxtapositions or ask the most ridiculous questions. So Montessori, uh, the son of Montessori had been there to teach him and because his mother started the first Montessori school in India. So I just found the kind of very nature of uh, this environment, uh, you know, very, very gratifying. So I started going every year that I possibly could go and he traveled back and forth. And artists continue to come and have their exchange and so forth. Does that answer your question? Or is there more? Oh, the brick pieces. So uh, I saw it was some kind of thing where there was a kind of wave. A, a, it was a, one of the first uh, digital uh, graphic things in brick. So it wasn't just, so I wanted to have brick also, I mean, they made a wave in brick. They warped it. And so I began to kind of do some drawings and kind of warp them too. And I thought, well, maybe I can do physically uh, something that was like a vessel at one end, and then that was like an elephant on the other end, but it also had a place to plant a big palm tree. So it, it was a tiny palm and it grew to groin. And my idea would be that it would send out these, you know, roots and totally destroy the sculpture at some point, or just embrace it in some way. They would become one. So I did that. I did a carving, and it was a trapezoid wall. And I did drawing on the wall. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I did it anyway. And you know, as we, you know, hatched away, that's what it became. This kind of form. The other form was a snake, where it was a kind of rectangular thing that I built a wall around a tree and then built a wall out from the tree because what, what happened basically was just a snake around the wall, a wall, and then I started carving that. But, and I had help, temple carvers. Uh, I drew, they carved. And so what happened was that the tree was dying anyway, so that's why I was allowed to do this. And then it fell, uh, a branch fell, and so I realized, well, part of the snake, then the snake had two heads, and then I would, it winded the two, kind of winded away where there were younger trees. I decided to kind of take it beyond that. But what was interesting about the snake because there's a day of the snake, worshiping the snake, it began to be worshiped and people would come there in the surrounding village that the farm was next to and start drawing on the snake, bringing flowers. And I have photographs of that too, which I should show. But, and I realized that uh, that was the first public sculpture really, other than the fountain that I'd done. And I realized how satisfying that was to have that. So in India, when even if something on the side of the road, as, as we do, you know, there's a camel rock in most places where there are rocks. People see camel rocks, or they see this or that, dog rock. Or, so they begin worshiping. It, it takes on a form which they can identify. And that's, that is what art is about. We, we have all these images, people searching for forms that they can explore, but also that they can share. So in India, it is very open in the sharing, and that's, that's the attraction. Yeah. Oh, in Ahmedabad. Okay, thank Amenabad. you. Okay, uh, I have Gujarat. a question. Gujarat. It's uh, a large city, but it's a large village, basically, of, in, in uh, this area 
uh, uh, near near the Gulf of Kutch, and then there's uh, the Sabarmati River. Gandhi was uh, there, and and this family supported Gandhi and built the ashram for Gandhi where he lived, and uh, they were mill owner family, and the mill owners of Bombay of uh, Ahmedabad built Bombay. The culture of Bombay it was a fishing village before. Uh, my question is, uh, I noticed a lot of your work is made out of uh, bronze. Do you have me? A lot of your work is made out of bronze. Yes. Is there a particular reason you use the heavy metal as your media? I think metal has energy. We, we know that it does. Uh, um, it it's, can be poured. I like the idea of the, it, it, it moves. It's liquid. I like the idea of freezing matter. Uh, I'm not as attracted to marble, but I want to explore that. I've been exploring quarries in India. They have some of the uh, nicest stone, white stone and black stone there. The black stone there has fine, fine white lines and, and is, is beautiful. Uh, the, <clears throat> the marble is some of the whitest marble. There's also very white, best marble in Greece. But India has a, the, these two one person owns these quarries and was given the quarries uh, by a member of my friend's mother, uh, uh, I, I think it was her uncle, that in exchange, he, his family were workers, carvers. They, they had uh, carvers in the family and they oversaw the carvers. So. Uh, there, they found, his father found, that there was <coughs> an old temple when they were digging. And um, so they realized the quality of the stone. There must be something un under the ground there. And they did, they saw a very old quarry. So this land was owned by one of the families. And uh, so the fellow that owns it got this huge and he's invested into the machinery in order to do all the digital work. So there are people from all over the world that he collaborates with architects, people that are building temples. Uh, uh, Putin even came to him because he wanted to decorate a facade in a kind of soft way. So, and they have designers there. So they, they, do, they do it all with this machinery. So it's pretty amazing uh, place and exciting. I, I you know, it, it's mind-boggling when you see the scale of a ten-story quarry and you see the slabs that are twice as wide as this. You know, here, you, you, actually, you'd see a slab like that, about that high, is that wall, and would go to, to end to end there. One, one, one stone slab. So they have to break it up, you can't move it. But you, would, you when you see it, you just think, my God, you know, what a painting, what, what a history. And you can see the layers, the history. Which, which part is this? Is this Excuse a, me? The part, all this, uh, party was in Ahmedabad. Are you from Ahmedabad? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Are you Jane? I'm, I know the Gujarati people. Yeah, so. I just, it's a Jane family. I just happened to mention okay. that. But maybe bigger. Are, are, and uh, you're here because you're an artist? No. I, I like artists and I like <laughs> art. I'm not an artist. Well, it's great that you're here. Okay. I feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> it's my home too. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's um, a wonderful place. Linda, could you, I mean, people here, there's different experiences of understanding art and appreciating art. And it's great that people are coming to this art fair and seeing a tremendous amount of art and getting to meet dealers and getting to meet artists and so forth. 
What can you tell people I, uh, when they go to look at art? What should they be doing when they look at art? Just to be open. Be open. Yeah, I, there's nothing you can tell anybody. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just be open. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's a good way to go. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> Enjoy.